Hey there. Did you know Kroger always gives you savings and rewards on top of our lower than low prices? And when you download the Kroger app, you'll enjoy over $500 in savings every week with digital coupons. And don't forget fuel points to help you save up to $1 per gallon at the pump. Want to save even more? With a Boost membership, you'll get double fuel points and free delivery. So shop and save big at Kroger today. Kroger, fresh for everyone. Savings may vary by state. Restrictions apply. See site for details. Hello and welcome to episode 163 of Drink the Movies. I'm Brian here as always with Michaela. And Michaela, as we come into our 163rd podcast episode, I just have one question for you. Okay. Are you not entertained? I am. I am entertained by all that we do, but I'm truly entertained by Russell Crowe in probably one of the best performances of his career. Uh I'm going to say <laughs> definitely, definitely one of the best performances of Joaquin Phoenix um, mm-hmm. and even uh, uh, Richard Harris. Some may say he was only in the film for a whole like four and a half minutes, uh, but really amazing as Marcus Aurelius in the movie Gladiator, which is what we're going to be talking about today. That's right. Yeah, we are uh, taking our uh, time machine and going back to the year 2000 to talk about Gladiator, you know, that Ridley Scott film that uh, came in and uh, swept over the world, made a ton of money, won a lot of awards and really captured the uh, kind of the imagination of people. And especially at the turn of the century, what was possible in terms of this epic storytelling, uh, what we're going to be able to do. And we're going to be talking about all that stuff today. But before we do that, Michaela, we need a cocktail that is reflective of the life and times of uh, Maximus and Commodus. Uh, So let's do that. Let's take a quick break and we'll be right back to up up this week's drink. Tell me what you've been doing, you busy little bee. Mm. So says Commodus to his sister, who he also wants to sleep with. It's kind of weird and incestuous, but uh, that got me thinking, Rome, Brian. man, Rome, Roman Empire stuff. <laughs> right. I mean, they had to come up with an heir some way. I mean, mm, I don't know. Right. Uh, it got me <laughs> no thinking other, about no other girls make... in all of Rome. Just gotta, <laughs> no, gotta go none of wanted him. He was so odious. I, ugh, he's so amazing. Joaquin was so good in it because no, I mean, I love him and I didn't want to touch him either. It was gross. Mm. Um, But it got me thinking about like what we could do for this cocktail, right? And I was scouring the internet, trying to come up with some different things. I thought about like, would if they made cocktails back in that time, like what would they be? And turns out they would be really gross. And we still have taste buds that work in in 2024. So we uh, came up with uh, the Busy Bee. um, And it comes (laughs) from Kelly Sparks of the Queen Bee Mixology. And we found this recipe on seattlerefined.com. Uh, I'm really excited about this because it comes, it, it brings in honey, which of course, because it alludes to a bee, um, but it has maraschino liqueur, which is something that I mm-hmm. have learned to love uh, with you over the course of the, the last couple of years. Yeah, and what is not to love because uh, maraschino liqueur and maraschino cherries are the most delicious things in the whole world, I'm pretty sure of it. And yeah, this... Uh, lo- this drink, of course, comes from that line there um, in the film when Commodus is uh, uh, laying it out for Lucilla that he knows exactly uh, what's going on, you busy little bees. And we thought that this was going to be really good. Um, there is a surprising lack of drinking uh, in the film. Most any time you watch anything that's set in like the Roman Empire or something, they're drinking like like 100 glasses of wine all the time, but very little of that uh, in this film. But we think that this is nice and it's old um, in terms of like... The United States cocktail history, because this is basically a bee's knees, which is a prohibition uh, era cocktail. This one's just going to be jazzed up a little bit. So let's go ahead and make one of these, Michaela. Let's grab a shaker tin and throw in two ounces of gin, one ounce of maraschino liqueur, three quarters of an ounce of lemon juice, three quarters of an ounce of honey, three dashes of orange bitters, and one bar spoon of Luxardo cherry juice. Uh, it's very syrupy, so uh, so tread lightly there. Go ahead and throw some ice in there, shake it and strain it into like a coupe glass or a martini glass. Uh, you can garnish it with a beautiful flower like Kelly Sparks did, or you can garnish it with uh, Luxardo cherry or just uh, leave it as is, maybe a lemon peel, something like that. Uh, sip and enjoy. So it's just a just a little cherry twist on that bee's knees. A classic, Michaela. What would you think about this one? Yeah. No, it's very good. Um, I truly loved this drink. Um, so we weren't able to 
drink this drink together. So I do remember sending you a message saying, what do you think? Um, I'd always like a bee's knees, but mm -hmm. I, I don't know if it's the maraschino liqueur that adds to it. If it's that extra bar spoon of the Luxardo cherry juice, because I really like that. I would recommend not uh, picking a gin that's too floral. I try to pick something that's really even and just balanced. Um, I use Brooker's for mine. Um, mm -hmm. But, you know, if you just try not to get something that's going to have a ton of extra notes in it because you don't want to muddle with the the flavor. Um, the honey created the honey and the cherry juice created this really syrupy, like coat mouthfeel uh, coating on your tongue, which I really found delicious. Mm -hmm. It was, it was my jam for sure without mm -hmm. being like pink or covered in elderflower. So <laughs> I loved it. Um, it was kind of pink. Uh, that uh, bar spoon of the cherry juice there does uh, tint it a little bit uh, pink. So it's very lo lovely looking. It's very delicious. Um, if I had one sort of uh, complaint or uh, kind of feedback, I guess, for the cocktail is that you're putting like that honey and the Luxardo cherry juice in there. Um, and they're both kind of syrupy. So when you put the ice in and you start shaking it, it tends to basically freeze uh, <laughs> solid <laughs> in your shaker tin. So uh, if you're going to be making up these or making up a few of them, you might want to go ahead and make like a honey uh, simple syrup. You can do that by doing two parts of honey to one part of water. So like a half cup of honey and or just a quarter cup of water. And that's going to, yeah, you know, just loosen it up a little bit uh, to get to your uh, cocktail go in there it's going to come out a little bit easier it's going to get you more of that honey flavor uh there into it as well which is always nice uh always good for some honey so uh let us know if you make up a busy little bee uh and uh let us know what you thought about it or if you have any other kind of bees knees variations we'd love to hear about all of that but for now michaela what we better do is we better mix up one of these because we have uh we have a battle to fight uh we have uh gladiators to battle with and we have a whole level of corruption we need to deal with so let's do this let's take a quick break and we'll be right back to chat about this week's film gladiator my name is maximus decimus meridius commander of the armies of the north General of the Felix Legions. Loyal servant to the true Emperor, Marcus Aurelius. Father to a murdered son. Husband to a murdered wife. And I will have my vengeance. In this life or the next. Spoiler warning. For Gladiator. If you've not yet seen this Ridley Scott masterpiece, you should press pause right now. You should go watch it. It's two and a half hours. I'm sorry, slash you're welcome. And make yourself up a busy little bee while you're at it. And then come back and we could chat about it because we're going to chat about all the things. Gladiator. Uh, yeah, spoiler warning for uh, for the movie Gladiator. You've had plenty of time to see this 24 years, um, and it's probably going to be making a comeback if I were to guess, because Gladiator Part Two is coming out later this year. Uh, Michaela, I think, or next year. I don't know. Sometime soon. We're going to have to uh, see how that comes along. Maybe we'll talk about it on the podcast one day. Uh, this was released in 2000, directed by Ridley Scott, and it stars Russell Crowe as Maximus, the leader of the Roman army turned gladiator, and Joaquin Phoenix as Commodus, the newly anointed Caesar. Uh, and Connie Nilsson is in this one playing uh, his sister, uh, Lucilla, a uh, former love interest of uh, Maximus. And uh, she's going to uh, be playing both sides here for a little bit and uh, really like her story. So we're going to be talking about that uh, as we get into it a little bit, Michaela. Uh, this did pretty well, this movie. It was uh, made on a budget of uh, roughly $100 million and came back with close to $450 million and box office returns. Pretty good, pretty good, and had a pretty good Oscar night as well. Nominated for 12 Oscars and winner of five uh, costume design janty yates uh is going to be back for uh, gladiator part two apparently as well uh won the oscar for best sound best visual effects uh best actor for russell crowe and best picture of them all uh did have some losses though so phoenix lost for supporting actor and ridley scott lost best director it also lost best original screenplay cinematography editing score art direction and set decoration so michaela 2000 we were like I don't know, Oscar night would have been, I guess, uh, uh, 2001, so we'd have been, like, in college. Do you remember, like, Gladiator being a big deal? Did you go out and see it uh, in college, or uh, did it come to you later? I did. Uh, Oscar night? What? What's the deal? <laughs> so I did. Um, I remember seeing the preview to this and thinking that this was this was Ridley Scott's answer to Braveheart uh, by that was directed by uh, Mel Gibson. Um, so five years earlier. So Braveheart was this really epic story, 
Um, and it, it crossed a lot of time and it was a, it was maybe 300 years earlier, but it was about, you know, somebody who was revolting and, and creating this idea of hope and stuff. And I thought that this was the, this was a very similar, um, sort of story about someone who was kind of rising up, uh, from the ashes and, and, you know, challenging an empire and, uh, what that would be. So, I was very interested in seeing it. I saw it. And then, um, and then of course I watched it win best picture, which was awesome. Mm -hmm. Um, and so it, it, it kind of created this cornerstone of what now is, has solidified itself in my mind of what, like an epic, um, kind of Spartacus esque, like challenging authority, bringing hope to people, bringing peace and prosperity and doing that in, in sort of a historical context, um, for sure. Um, I, I only think I saw it maybe one other time. And then for the, for the sake of this podcast, revisiting it. And I'm so glad we did because, um, you know, there's a lot to this film that I don't think I had a really proper appreciation of 24 years ago that I do now. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. It was um, it was really fun to go back in and revisit it. So let's uh, let's get into it here, uh, Michaela, just a little bit. And basically, the film kind of unfolds into three parts. So it gets it gets started, and of uh, you have kind of the very famous visual there of um, uh, your Russell Crowe, your Maximus, kind of walking through this wheat field, uh, running his hand through it, and then we're thrust into the very beginning uh, action set piece of this. We're uh, with the uh, Roman army there that he is the uh, general of, I guess, or commander of, leader of. Uh, uh, anyway, and they're uh, basically on their final battle of this uh, tour uh, that is uh, more or less opening up all of Europe to the Roman Empire. So we've got uh, Marcus Aurelius is there on hand to watch uh, this unfold and the battle plays out as you might expect. The Roman army is victorious. So Maximus, uh, hero of Rome uh, and confidant of Marcus Aurelius. Pretty good place to be at the start of the film if you're Maximus. What is Rome, Maximus? I've seen much of the rest of the world. It is brutal and cruel and dark. Rome is the light. Yet you have never been there. You have not seen what it has become. I am dying, Maximus. When a man sees his end, he wants to know there was some purpose to his life. How will the world speak my name in years to come? Will I be known as the philosopher, the warrior, the tyrant? Or will I be the emperor who gave Rome back her true self? Yeah, but Maximus doesn't want to be there. He wants to be home. Um, he is a farmer, <laughs> apparently, uh, a wheat farmer. Um, and he wants to be home with his wife and his son, um, who he hasn't seen in like three years. Um, I, 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 he, he wants to... Um, uh, go back and tend his crops. And he's like, in three weeks, that's where I'm going to be. Uh, I love the speech that he gives to his men. Cause he's like, look, you know, everybody's got a place they want to be. And if you find yourself in that place, you're, you're probably already dead. So who cares? Like, let's, let's go, let's mm -hmm. go, let's go team. Right. Um, he, he, I really love the way we meet Maximus in, in this, this opening sequence, because you've got all of the, uh, inner workings and the choreography of uh, and the cinemat cinematography around the battle itself. But then you see him do things that seem a little strange. Like he loves to pick up the, the earth in his hands and feel it. And, you know, that's something that we see him do throughout the film. Anytime he's going to go into battle and you don't mm -hmm. really know if it's, you know, for a pragmatic reason of like making sure that his hands don't get, like slimy and sweaty or if, right. if it's something that he does with his like a ritual prayer, but you, you get to meet him and like the way he shows up for his team and his men. And then the way he shows up uh, respectfully and dissents against Marcus Aurelius, because Marcus Aurelius has plans for him uh, in this kind of last ditch effort to be thought of as a great emperor of Rome. Mm -hmm. And, uh, he Maximus doesn't want any of that glory. He just wants to go home, <laughs> you know? Yeah. yeah, exactly. Um, you get kind of the, the insight here at the beginning of the film. And I, I do think that the, the first battle and it's, it's pretty lengthy. It's like the first like 20 ish minutes of the, of the film is kind of this battle and setting it up and, uh, kind of the immediate aftermath of it there, but it's setting up, you know, that Maximus is, you know, kind of this, the strategic thinker. And obviously he's a very good, uh, leader of men. We find out, you know, kind of directly after that he has this, um, you know, at least kind of close, 
working relationship, I guess, with uh, Marcus Aurelius, who uh, goes on to then entrust Maximus to uh, take over all of Rome. And Maximus is like, yeah, not that interested uh, in that, to be honest. Um, but luckily, we have someone, unluckily, I don't know, someone is on their way that is definitely interested in that. I really love you have kind of this like motorcade of uh, the Roman royalty coming in on these uh, carriages. And we're introduced to Commodus, played by Joaquin Phoenix, and Lucilla, played by uh, Connie Nielsen. They're, they're on their way. I love kind of their, their little banter. And you can just see Commodus is basically like foaming at the mouth that his dad's about ready to die. And he's going to get to take over uh, as heir to the Roman Empire as the new Caesar. Um, but Lucilla, you know, is playing it down. She's like, oh, you know, he's old and sick. He's been sick for a long time. He's been sick for like 10 years. And he keeps uh, calling us out here. No big deal. No big deal. But when Commodus finds out from his dad that he's going to be passed over, doesn't take too kindly to that. Which wise the older man is to take my place? My powers will pass to Maximus. To hold in trust until the Senate is ready to rule once more. Rome is to be a republic again. Ugh, he doesn't. I mean, and here's where I feel like this is the plot hole that is maybe, also the maybe thing that, maybe you like, don't say anything it seems like he's the kind of guy that would take this news poorly right, marcus right. aurelius yeah this is a historical fiction right so but marcus aurelius was a real person not a stupid guy he conquered like half of the roman empire in his life or something close to it he did he did some pretty great stuff you would think that he would have enough uh, knowingness of his own child's prodigious like want of um, ambition and like power hungriness that he would not be like, Hey, just letting you know, I'm going to let this other guy who just won this war for me, I'm going to let him lead. And you know, I failed that you. your sister's kind Sorry. of into yeah. <laughs> <laughs> like, like that you've been like Ian forever in this really incestuous and gross way. Yeah. I'm just going to give all of that to him. Uh, sorry about it. Um, it's my bad. It's, I mean, I love at the end, he's like, it, you know, these failings that you have are really not your fault. They're my fault as a father. Sorry. And, and it's like, dude, you're supposed to be smarter than this. You're like a, you're like a global strategist and yet you, you make this mistake. And, and it's unfortunate that they use that as like the, the crux of the entire plot of this movie, because I feel like that is a real poor choice um it doesn't right. really hold true to me and so i found myself watching this film getting more and more angry at marcus aurelius's choice where it's like are you kidding me right now you <laughs> had to have known that this was not going to end well for you or maximus right or, did you not care at all didn't care any of them care i mean i i guess you know you gotta you gotta bearer of bad news i guess but yeah it seemed, it seemed like a bad idea it seemed like a bad idea so anyways anyways uh commodus uh totally uh snuffs out marcus aurelius right uh gives him like a gives him like a like a faux hug kind of thing and uh basically suffocates him there he is dead commodus is ready to take over they come and get maximus in the middle of the night and say oh the caesar caesar is dead so maximus goes uh bedside and he's like Oh, how did he die? And they're like, oh, natural causes, no big deal. And then, of course, Commodus is there ready to step in. Maximus didn't uh, give him his word that he was going to take over. I uh, hadn't really told anyone yet, of course. So uh, this is pretty bad timing, I will say. Marcus Aurelius should have at least waited till you were for, for sure that Maximus was going to going to take over. And then Commodus says uh, to Maximus, you know, go ahead and kiss my ring. Uh, bygones can be bygones. You can be my loyal subject. That'll be great. Um, this is the other one for me, Michaela. Why didn't Maximus be like, yeah, that's fine because i just wanted to go home to spain anyway don't care about your politics i uh, could have done that yes. but instead maximus is like no man i'm not going to do that i'm not going to kiss your ring uh, i'm not going to follow you i'm going to leave and you know people people keep messing with commodus and commodus is like fine i'm going to send the army uh to arrest you and go kill you uh take that maximus take that maximus and not only that he's like not only am I going, you know, Commodus, he's like a giant man child, right? He is the epitome of what we think of as short man syndrome, right? He He's like, oh, you're not going to kiss my ring. Well, not only am I going to kill you, but I'm going to go to your farm. I'm going to set it on fire. I'm going to rape and kill your wife. I'm going to hurt, you know, set your son aflame. Like, it's the worst. He's like, burn it all to the ground because he wouldn't kiss a ring. I don't know. I Again, Maximus, probably not a stupid person. Apparently he wasn't real and based on a real person. But um, I would have thought he would have been smarter and been like, all I have to do is kiss this ring and Rome, it might be screwed. But I get to go home to my beautiful to wife home. and kid that I haven't seen in three years. Get, get I, I don't know. Farmer. 
again, I am a coward, and that's probably the choice I would have made. Maximus, True. not a coward, not the choice he <laughs> makes, and he does pay for it. And it's really a horribly sad moment because he is being told that he's going to be killed, right? They, they're pretty open about it. And he talks to his friend Quintus, who was like his man at arms or something, and says, hey, can you just promise me you'll look after my kids? And he looks right at him and he's like, oh, yeah, about that. Your kids are your your family your, is totally your family's be, your family's toast. Your family's toast. Yeah, for sure. He does have uh, one confidant there, Cicero. He's played by uh, Tommy Flanagan. That's like his uh, I don't know, like his like his uh, his ward, I guess, who helps him, you know, get ready for battle um, and all that yeah. stuff. So uh, Maximus is able to, you know, kind of get the slip on them. Right. They take him out to uh, to execute him in, in the woods. I think he tells him to go for a day's ride and uh, gets a slip on them. He does get wounded, though, so he's a little slow making his way back home to Spain. And by the time he gets there, uh, wife and kid, uh, it's a no go. It's a no go uh, for Maximus there. So what are you going to do? You're wandering around aimlessly. You're wounded. You're tired. You pass out and you get caught by some slave traders. Uh, that's not good. And they're going to send you to northern Africa. And guess what? Now uh, you're sold to this guy uh proximo is played by oliver reed proximo probably my favorite character um in the film uh other than uh joaquin phoenix's uh commodus uh for sure but i really like proximo here and he's a uh, he's pretty no nonsense he's like i'm an entertainer i just want to make money and that's what you're going to do for me get in there you're a gladiator now i don't care if you want to or not because i'm going to profit off of you either way i paid it so that i could profit from your death and as your mother was there at your beginning, so I shall be there at your end. That's right. Um, no, Oliver Reed is amazing as Proximo. I love this character. He's one of my favorite characters in this whole show because he talks about how he had once been a gladiator himself and how Marcus Aurelius freed him and said, hey, you know, I'm going to do that because uh, Proximo apparently was really good at making the crowd love him. Because again, this is all entertainment. These were people that, and, and gladiators were real. Um, they, these were people that really did live and die by the sword in front of hundreds of thousands of people. And we treated it as if it was like Monday Night Football. It was like no big deal, right? It was like, ah, oh, they cut off his mm -hmm. fingers. It's, it's fine. Um, and so uh, Proximo is like, dude, all you have to do is, you know, not die and make the crowd love you. And that is how you're going to make it through as a gladiator. Because at the end of the day, it's just show business that ends in life and death. No big deal. But I do want to talk a little bit about the relationship that Juba uh, who's one of the uh, African tribesmen who's also taken from his home and family mm -hmm, by slave mm -hmm, traders. Mm -hmm. And he's kind of becomes this fast friend of Maximus, right? Um, he helps him with his wound. Uh, it's so gross. gross. I love the scene, so but it's gross. super gross. He wakes up and he's like, they're maggots like hanging out. And he's like, don't touch them. They're going to clean out all the dead skin and stuff. And oh, it's totally gross. Um, so but apparently gross. that that was a real thing that happened. Um that they used to do but uh juba is really um like a dedicated friend like almost immediately and i really love their relationship because they have these talks about what's what was your family like before what do you do you think you'll see them again and they both have very different beliefs um mm -hmm. i i believe i right because uh maximus um he had these like wooden little talisman tokens that he would pray to and he lo loses them uh in in the whole fight when he is going off to be killed um mm -hmm. and so they but he will talk openly with juba about what they think the other side looks like and who's waiting for them and all of that and i really love that piece um because it just humanizes uh this whole scenario which we think as well is very entertaining because we're watching a movie about it but it was also pretty horrible right that these people mm -hmm. were taken and being right. yeah. like pawns in a play yeah for sure and you know a lot of times in like a war film or like a period piece you don't get a lot of uh, uh good like character building but yeah the the introduction of uh, juba there and uh turning it into kind of this this friendship and this camaraderie that this group of uh, gladiators has is really good. Uh, Juman Hanshu is the uh, actor who's playing Juba here. Really, really excellent. And the other really, really excellent part about this, um, I thought, Michaela, watching it back, you know, you think of Gladiator and you think of like all the technical merits and stuff when they recreated Rome and, you know, recreated the Colosseum and stuff. And we'll talk about that here in a minute. Uh, 
but I really like how uh, they brought to the the town of Zukabar. I guess it's uh, like the Algerian town where uh, they're taken in the first fights are because I guess they like actually like reconstructed this whole like kind of like city center uh, where they were going and fighting yeah. then in these first couple of fights. I thought that that was, you know, epic and amazing. And uh, then we're brought back into the fold with Maximus, you know, being this leader of men, right? He's able to get the gladiators there who, uh, by all accounts, are are scared <laughs> for their lives, right? They're, they're, you know, enslaved and sent out here to, uh, to live or die or perish. But maximum or Maximus gives them a, uh, a level of, uh, hope and confidence that they're going to be able to survive and does end up, uh, winning over, uh, the people here. Are you not entertained? Are you not entertained? And that's going to, uh, get this little crew of, uh, ragtag <laughs> gladiators uh, on their way to Rome because Rome, as we mentioned, they have a new Caesar, and the new Caesar there, uh, Commodus, has decided to, uh, you know, to shine a shine a good light on himself. You know, maybe he wasn't the first choice for Caesar for the people of Rome, but uh, what better way to, you know, warm everyone's icy cold Roman hearts than to have 150 days of death in the uh, gladi gladiatorial ring? So that's what he's going to do: 150 day celebration to celebrate uh, Marcus Aurelius, but to also celebrate Commodus. Um, and now is going to be the opportunity that Maximus needed to go back and confront his nemesis. Yes, um, I really love when they come back, and this was the first time I had noticed it that the people were not pleased. There's like this big welcome home kind of tribute to the new Caesar and uh, Lucilla. Um, and they're both there. Commodus and Lucilla are there and people aren't super happy. Some of them are screaming profanities and like shaking their fists. And and um, in true Commodus's form, right? Like when he goes to see Marcus Aurelius and they show up at the battlefront, he's not like, hey, let me help with the battle that just happened. He's like, I will sacrifice a bunch of stuff in your honor. And Marcus Aurelius is not impressed. Right. So of mm -hmm. course, what is he going to do to show his power? He's going to have like 150 days of gladiator fights. And so every gladiator that's in the entire, you know, area of Italy is like, you know, coming into Rome uh, because they need all these people to fight because they're all going to die within the first couple of battles. Right. Um, mm -hmm. And I thought, I found that to be really interesting that they talk about the economics of that and like how, this is good, but it's also really bad. And even uh, Proximo is like, I'm going to lose like all my men for year for the next three years because he just wants to look at himself and feel good about what he's doing and uh, pat himself on the back as the new emperor that nobody likes. Like, I just thought that was interesting. That was uh, pretty interesting. Uh, and yeah, we are on our way back to Rome. So we're finally going to be able to get to see that. And as you mentioned, you know, Proximo is, uh, has said he was a, a former uh, gladiator and was given his um, his freedom by Marcus Aurelius there. He has got like a little wooden sword and, and he talks. He you know, says that Marcus Aurelius uh, touched him on the shoulder and that was all it took for him to win his freedom. Maximus is like, you weren't friends with Marcus Aurelius. Calm down, Maximus. That's not what he said. He just said, no, I just said that he touched my shoulder and I'm free. Calm down, Maximus. But let's go to Rome. Let's go to Rome. Uh, Rome looks amazing uh, in this, especially, you know, for 2000. They're recreating all of this stuff that we've only ever been able to, you know, conjure up in our dreams the way that this... Uh, Colosseum, and then you know kind of the the rest of the the landscape of rome it looks really really beautiful and then you kind of get that first scene of them going into the Colosseum, and apparently uh this was where about 90 percent of the uh, special effects budget went was to that one shot of recreating the first uh, Colosseum scene because it kind of goes in and it pans around and that was pretty new at the time in terms of visual effects and making them look right and making it look seamless enough where they could you know kind of spin this camera around in there and you're seeing all the different uh levels of the Colosseum and things like that but uh maximus is going to have to make it through three fights if he wants to get one up on the uh uh the caesar there commodus right so we get the uh the first one and people are already uh starting to be pretty excited about that one they call spaniard including uh lucius played by spencer treat clark the uh the son of lucilla gladiator are you the one they call the spaniard yes they said you were a giant they said you could crush a man's skull with one hand. Yeah. Um, I, I think he does such a great job of kind of having to manage both of his parents <laughs> or both of his, his adults, as it as it were, <laughs> uh, because he, his mom has uh, I, she seems to have had a very um, 
kind of cunningness about her. In fact, Marcus Aurelius uh, has said, you know, you would have made a really amazing emperor. You would have made a great Caesar if you had been born a man. Um, but uh, she was not. And so she's just trying to kind of do the best that she can for her son. Um, apparently, Maximus and her had had a thing uh, in the past. We don't know much about it. Uh, we don't. But um, she got married, had Lucius, and then her, her husband passed. And so now there's this like weirdness between Commodus and uh, Lucilla, where he he keeps saying, you know, you should stay with me tonight. And she's like, absolutely not. That's gross. But she does it in a way that somehow does not get her throat slit because Commodus is capable of anything. And Lu Lucius is like, just really gently like talks to his, his, his uncle and manages his uncle. Um, but he ends up going to watch one of the first fights. And so he looks down at the Spaniard, who is this gladiator that keeps winning, uh, which is interesting. And they, the gladiator recognizes his name and knows exactly who he is. And so um, Maximus has been swearing revenge for the longest time. And uh, I don't know if he expects, if he catches a, like a real plan to say, I'm going to win this. And then once Commodus gets closer to me, I'm going to kill him. Or, or, or if he just thinks that he's going to just do the best mm -hmm. that he can. And, uh, yeah. but he ends up winning uh, tremendously. Well, <laughs> that first fight, it's real, real bloody. <laughs> he ends up winning tremendously. Well, yeah, absolutely. Uh, so you've got the, the kid Lucius comes and, and talks to him and he finds out that, you know, Lucius is the is the son of Lucilla, you know, nephew to uh, Commodus. So at this point, Maximus realizes that, you know, Commodus is back. Commodus is there. He's going to be there um, at the competition. So I really like then you get Maximus. He puts on the helmet to kind of protect his identity. And you, you think kind of at the outset, uh, they bring in, you know, like the Roman chariots and they're reenacting uh, some more. It's a pretty, pretty epic fight scene uh, there. But kind of at the end, and, you know, Maximus picks up this spear and he's like riding the horse out there and you think he's just going to, you know, chuck the spear over at Commodus and be done with it. I don't think Maximus really had plans as far as, uh, you know, winning his freedom. Other he was he was just there to basically kill Commodus and be done with it. Right. Go join his uh, family in the afterlife was really his only plan. But uh, it kind of kind of takes a turn. He gets there. He gets the opportunity and doesn't take it. Um and at that point, you know, Commodus comes out and, uh, you know, the soldiers kind of surround all of the gladiators there and, uh, you know, gives uh, Maximus the uh, the old thumbs up. But not before uh, Maximus is, uh, you know, kind of told to remove his helmet and realizes uh, that this is, you know, this is that guy that, that you were supposed to have dealt with uh, like a long time ago. And uh, he's back from the dead, as it seems. And uh, now he's going to be a bit of a thorn in your side, because not only do the people of Rome not really care for you, Commodus, you've also got the uh, senators there of Rome also don't care for you and they're planning a coup and uh i'm not like a roman historian by any stretch of the imagination but it seemed like if you were a caesar uh basically your only way out was to get uh assassinated stabbed in the back uh, by someone and uh commodus is having it come in from all fronts now including his entertainment that he brought in for his 150 day <laughs> celebration right <laughs> Um, he's super paranoid. Uh, this this is when imposter syndrome is real, and it's like, dude, you shouldn't be here. <laughs> like, read the room. the The Senate doesn't want you here. Your sister doesn't want you here. The people don't want you here. Uh, but he is way too proud for that. Um, and he knows it. Um, it, it's really interesting. He he's kind of compelled by the crowd to let Maximus live. Um, they go through. Uh, kind of this banter back and forth. And I, Maximus says, you know, I was the son to a murdered wife and I am a father to a murdered son and I will have my vengeance. And it's like really famous. Um, but uh, Lucilla is is trying to kind of figure this out between them. And sh she's the cunning one. So she goes to Maximus's cell. Uh, she sneaks in to try and say, hey, look, um, if you want to meet with uh, Gaius, who's one of the Senate senators uh we can figure this out and of course maximus is like absolutely not i don't believe you at all <laughs> like i don't believe any <laughs> nope absolutely not no i just i just i just want my vengeance did he send you i mean he's very distrustful of her um and you get a feeling that it's because she she might have heard him uh somehow in the past and that's why everybody kind of knows they had a thing but nobody knows mm. they had a thing and yeah. Well, it starts to write off on that first battle. Uh, she's like staring out the tent, like checking them out. And then uh, Marcus Aurelius comes in and, and sees her there, I, I think, you know, looking out at him. So, yeah, it's pretty obvious that they had some sort of a, a fling going going way back, way back. But 
yeah, I mean, not trustful of anyone here. Uh, Maximus, I really like they're kind of sitting around the the gladiators there in their little like training camp, uh, little makeshift uh, housing area there, and they go and get their their food. And Maximus is even like afraid that someone has poisoned his food, so the one guy you know eats it, and then they end up kind of laughing it off. Um, on a side note, they wouldn't have bothered poisoning you; they just go and cut your head off. Uh, that's what they that's what they would have done. They wouldn't have uh, taken the time to poison your food uh, for sure. So uh, that is one fight down. We're on to the second fight. Uh, you know, Commodus is like, how do I get rid of this guy? Let's bring this old uh, champion gladiator out of retirement. He will come. Uh, he's going to wear a really cool mask and uh, come in. You'll have a fight. There's going to be tigers there. Ridley Scott really has a thing for uh, having having animals have a bad time uh, in his movies for sure. But there's tigers there. They look awesome. They're in these pits. And he uh, has this fight with this guy who uh, eventually Maximus gets the one up on uh, there. And, you know, the crowd is uh, chanting for him to to kill him. Uh Caesar says, uh, thumbs down, kill that guy. Uh, but Maximus doesn't because Maximus is merciful. Maximus the merciful. Uh, is there anyone else that could be merciful, Michaela? Uh, yeah. Um, well, Commodus certainly thinks he can be. I mean, this puts, this really puts him in a, in a tough place because he's like, what? Now I can't kill him because everybody loves him. And he, he has like a serious, like five-year-old temper tantrum. And I love it so much. I'm here for it because this is exactly what you think, uh, like a spoiled child would act. This is it, like, mm -hmm. like, um, and he does it so well. He's so gross. Um, cause he's like, I, 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 we have to figure out how to kill him, but I can't kill him now. Oh, what am I going to do? And so, um, he tells Falco, his advisor, to follow everybody. Um, he decides that he's going to have Maximus killed, uh, or he he wants to, but he's he's not going to have Maximus killed yet because he might become this martyr, and then then it'll be even worse. Um, it's a whole thing, and I love it so much. But it it does end up not not going so great <laughs> because Maximus uh, reconnects with Cicero, as you said, uh, Tommy Tommy Flanagan who mm -hmm, uh, mm -hmm. is amazing. I love him so much in everything he does. He's like the best character actor uh, in the world. I love him so much. Um, but he he's there and he gives him back his little, his little, uh, his little figures, yeah. his little figures so he can pray properly, which is really cool. Um, he goes on Maximus's behalf to meet with Lucilla and Gracchus. Um, they agree uh, that, hey, if we can help Maximus escape Rome and join his his legions up somewhere else, um, they can, you know, fight Commodus by force and they can bring all the power back to the Senate. Um, that could be really great. Um, but because Commodus is now freaking out and has his guy Falco, like, ear to the ground and spying on everybody, um, Gracchus ends up getting arrested. Uh, Lucilla kind of shows up and into this meeting with between um, Commodus and Lucius. And that's where we get the busy little bee speech because Commodus is going to find out exactly what happened. And um, and there's there's this kind of plan on this like feet on top of this plan that they've all constructed to try and get Maximus out of the gladiator i don't know stronghold that they're all in that then goes completely awry and it's really awful and sad to watch mm -hmm. yeah they kind of come up with a plan right like you said they're uh, going to get maximus out he's going to be able to go rejoin his army but unfortunately uh commodus catches wind of of this plan from his uh nephew there uh bad move nephew why do people keep uh taunting commodus he seems like one not to be trifled with even the nephew is like no i'm being the the savior of rome don't say you're the savior of rome to the leader of rome that seems bad that seems like a bad idea <laughs> that's uh, not Lucius, a good what idea are you, dude. what are you thinking of what are you thinking of so yeah so commodus is like all right now i have to kill everyone so he does he uh captures the senator uh he goes in and they capture all of the gladiators he uh you know has his people kind of set this trap for him there where uh, Cicero is uh, hanged uh, off of his horse and they recapture uh, Maximus. And Maximus goes. He has one more fight uh, to give, but Commodus is going to take things into his own hands uh, this time. And by his own hands, I mean he's going to stab Maximus before the fight starts so he can be sure to win. But uh, it's going to take more than uh, one little uh, knife wound uh, to Russell Crowe to uh, win this uh, last fight. Uh, but it's beautiful, right? They come up, they have the 
uh, he's rising up like on this riser. They have like the the Roman soldiers are all around him with their with their shields down. It kind of opens up and Commodus uh, comes out there against Maximus and they have this last fight to the death. Um, I love the army comes in and kind of surrounds them and Commodus starts yelling at him to give him a sword because Maximus has disarmed him uh, and uh, it was a uh, Falco, I believe, is like is like everyone sheath your swords. Don't don't give him a sword. Uh, this was his uh, bed that he's made. And I guess we're going to let him lay in it now and lay in it. He does. Commodus meets his untimely end, uh, which apparently gives Maximus, uh, you know, power over Rome for at least the last couple of minutes of his life, says uh, <laughs> free all the people and senators. You're in charge now. And I'm dead, dead now. <laughs> I mean, yeah, uh, it's a little bit more poignant than that. But yeah, it it, it, it is that way. Um, I, I really like that Commodus, of course, can't, it, it's not enough that they like mortally wound Maximus before they, he goes out, right? Um, it's not enough that he, I don't know if that was like just a poisoned uh, stab or just a regular stab in like a special area, but they're like, cover mm. the wound. Um, and so of, of course, Quintus is like, like this guy has no um, honor because he is covering Maximus's wound and they're fighting. But Maximus, I mean, he fought tigers and won. This guy's no match for him at all. Um, and you can see it like within the first like 30 seconds, like poor, I, poor Commodus. He doesn't have a choice. He, he, he does not have a chance, um, mm -hmm. but he continues to try and fight he asks everybody else to give him a sword they're like absolutely not dude you're on your own but then of course he goes and he has this dagger and it's that dagger that um ends up being commodus commodus undoing right because if he didn't have the dagger he wouldn't have gotten i don't know what he does get stabbed in the neck or something it's pretty pretty gross mm -hmm, um mm -hmm. and maximus lays on the ground, up falling to the ground you know, Lucilla comes out and talks to him. And I, I love this. It, it, it It's very similar to the feeling that you get. The score kind of rises. You get this really beautiful, like, uh, like look back in at the fields and he sees his wife and his son kind of waiting there, ready for him as he's going to, um, to his version of heaven. And um, it's really beautiful the way that he, he kind of feels, uh, you feel that he's lifted and he's honored. Um, Lucilla tells you know, everybody who's listening that he was a soldier of Rome and they kind of carry him out. Uh, they leave Commodus's body just hanging there. Uh, they just leave him there. And I, I find that really interesting. Like there's got to be hundreds of people who are in the stands going, what just happened? Did we really just see this? Um, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I imagine it was a, a pretty shocking day there for the uh, the citizens of Rome who were on hand. But yeah, they totally just leave him there. Um, I want to talk a little bit about kind of... Um, Kind of the way that this looks coming in. I don't know how much of it was uh, practical, how much of it was, um, you know, some special uh, VFX sort of thing going on. But the entire like stadium floor of the arena is covered in these rose petals, and it looks absolutely uh, beautiful. Um, it even looks beautiful when they're you know carrying Maximus out and Commodus is uh, just left uh, laying there. And we're going to kind of get one final thing, right? Maximus goes back into his little uh, dream or vision there where he's going through and he opens the gates and he goes and sees his family. But uh, Juba is going to come back out and bury those little figures there. He says, uh, you know, I'll meet you uh, one day again, but not not today. And they bur he buries the little uh, figures there in the floor of the uh, Coliseum, uh, which is really, really a beautiful uh, thing there. Uh, good job, Juba. And that is you know, kind of where it ends, you know, it's a, it's a tale of uh, revenge and political intrigue. And uh, Maximus, you know, is able to, to get the one up and fulfill Marcus Aurelius's last wish is to turn Rome over to uh, being a Republic uh, again, I guess, in the way that it was founded. Um, really, really good stuff there. So uh, Michaela, as you mentioned, you know, it had been a long time since either of us had seen this. I've, I think I've probably watched it a little bit more recently than you. Um, it was something I'd watch every couple of years, at least for the first uh, few years after um, after it came out. But this movie is very highly regarded. It's like ranked in, I don't know, it's like number 37, I think, on IMDb's top film uh, list and stuff like that. What were your thoughts going back to it versus when you watched it originally? So originally, I was think I think I was comparing it too much with the previous epic film that I had seen that I thought was amazing, which was Braveheart, right? And mm -hmm, for the mm -hmm. longest time, I would say Braveheart was one of my favorite movies, if not my favorite movie of all time. I know it's not historically accurate. We can debate about that later. That's fine. But um, but I thought that this this was not as good. So when when the movie came out, I was like, well, it's no Braveheart. Um, 
I will say that having grown up in the last 24 years, I, I developed a, a much deeper appreciation for all the things that went into this from a um, artistic rendering and just the special effects. I, I love the score of this movie so mm -hmm. much. Um, it, and it's a score that I think is reused or at least people, pieces of it have been reused or drawn inspiration for other kind of uh, epic, you know, battle sequences yeah. that have happened since then. Right. So I, I think it aged beautifully. You hear the kind of that main theme on a lot of just like, like film type things where you're watching like, uh, like behind, behind the scene stuff or like you know the oscars and stuff they'll play that theme from gladiator a lot and it's on zimmer um it is a it's a little i don't know it's kind of it's kind of interesting it's similar to the dune soundtrack and in, in that way where you have kind of this big like sweeping thing and then there's stuff that's almost like this like industrial rock sounding pieces in it it's it's really strange it's kind of all over the place you know very hans yeah. zimmery but yeah definitely definitely that main theme is a uh, is a movie classic for sure yeah um, I, I love I love the testament that it is to friendship um, and the the characters really do stand the test of time. I think this film has done really well. Um, it the special effects are amazing. They're still amazing. I mean, it's it's almost a quarter of a century old and Rome still looks amazing. That sweeping um Colosseum view where you kind of are going over the Colosseum and doing this kind of wide look at everybody who's there. And um, I have no idea how they did that, but that is still one of the most amazing shots that I've ever seen. Um, mm -hmm. And so I, you know, I really love this and I love the story. I think that uh, again, Joaquin Phoenix as Commodus is one of the worst villains. I think he's he's in the top 100 of like worst villains of all time. I, I don't know how high he is, but because he's just so gross and horrible and he just doesn't care. Right. He doesn't have any like he's just complete amoral, completely amoral and power hungry. He does not care what he has to do. He would. I, I mean, even he says, like, I would bathe in your son's blood if it would get me what I wanted, like. He does not care. And he's so he's so amazing at it. He's so very conniving. And yeah, it, just kind of that first like opening or like a uh, monologue he has there in front of his father, you know, telling him all of all the virtues that he does have. And they're all of these uh, things that um, I guess on one hand might make you a good good leader of uh, of Rome for sure. But yeah, um, this was this was really good to go back to. I haven't like I said, I probably haven't watched it in. I don't know, 20 years, maybe uh, something like that. But yeah, it definitely it definitely holds up in terms of the the special effects and, and the sound design and and all of that stuff really, really well. All of those, uh, you know, big famous lines still hit kind of the same way uh, that they do when you're watching it uh, the first time. And yeah, just kind of the kind of the like the epic scope of it. It was it was a weird time in uh, the year 2000. We were kind of getting into this more like uh, digital filmmaking and what kind of doors that was going to to open up and um you know, for me, it was it was that stuff that really propelled it. Um, it had the battle um, in the front. You kind of compared it to Braveheart. And uh, to me, that felt very pedestrian and slow compared to Braveheart. It wasn't nearly as big an epic in that first kind of war uh, battle there with the Roman army. Uh, but then the stuff you're bringing it inside of of the Colosseum and um, the way that the cinematography worked there was really, really beautiful um, and uh, just so glorious to watch and you know it's uh, glorious anytime you get to watch uh Joaquin Phoenix um in something because even even in stuff that he's been in that hasn't been great uh he's still great uh for sure and uh he's great in this and I love kind of the characterization of that I love Lucilla as a character and how she's kind of playing kind of playing both sides and she knows exactly what kind of strings she can pull and what she can kind of get away with with Commodus uh, right there at the beginning, uh, right after she basically realizes that uh, he killed her father. She goes in and, you know, slaps him in the face and then kisses his ring. Right. She knows exactly what she can uh, get away with in terms of uh, of Commodus. And I guess uh, she's going to be a pretty uh, major player here in the second gladiator. Uh, if we uh, get that here in the next uh, year or two, whenever that's supposed to supposed to come out, I guess it's going to be uh, focusing on her son. But she's going to to be there. So I will have to see how that story plays out. Maybe uh, drink the movie is up. Uh, part two of gladiator gladiator part two i don't know uh michaela but this was a good one um i was very excited to watch it and i was very excited to have this uh uh busy little bee cocktail because it was a perfect accompaniment to going back to this 2000 uh epic adventure yeah no i agree and i just want to say one thing um so the the woman who plays 
Maximus's wife in all the heaven stuff, right? They 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 do a really good job of um conveying what happens to his wife and son without it being too gory. I mean, this is not for mm -hmm. kids, right? This is this is rated R. It should be rated R. It's, like, it's, it's plenty not, gory enough. Without, it's plenty gory without enough. That. Uh but um Giannina Facio, um, she uh ends up being married to Ridley Scott later in life. I they they I, I don't know when they dated, but they how long they dated for a very long time, but they got married mm. in 2015. So um, you know, everybody uh, I think on set felt that this this was someone worth dying for. And it's so I, I really love that uh I, that tidbit because I was like, who is that woman? Because she's quite striking in the scenes where he mm -hmm. feels where Maximus is seeing her um, and the sun is on her and her, the wind is blowing through her hair. And it's just this very hopeful kind of I idea. Um, yeah. Yeah. It's, and it ended up being Ridley Scott's wife. He was okay. like, I love that too. I, I, this is my idea of heaven. That's, that's kind of cool. That's right. That's right. There's a, uh, uh... Yeah, exactly right. So uh, that is Gladiator. Uh, so let us know at home if you make up a busy little bee cocktail. Send us pictures and let us know what you thought about that. And let us know what you think about Gladiator. Let us know where you th think it stands in terms of uh, of historical dramas, of you know these epic adventures, of Ridley Scott films. Let us know all that stuff. You can do that on our uh, social medias. That's at Drink the Movies on instagram and x and threads and blue sky and on facebook.com slash drink the movies uh, you can go to our website if you want to see pictures of our uh, busy little bee cocktail find out the written recipe uh, episode recaps all that stuff is there on the websites and if you're looking for some drinks and movies and merchandise you can do that now too we just opened our merchandise store here this past week and that is drink the movies dot square dot site uh, getting some new stuff added here over the next couple of weeks so keep an eye on that and let us know if there's anything uh, you would love to see there uh, go and check out our patreon if you want some more uh, behind the scenes stuff, uh, bonus episodes, extra cocktail uh, chats and hangouts, all that good stuff. You can do that on our Patreon. It's patreon.com slash drink to movies. Uh, that's the best place to go to support the web podcast. And we definitely appreciate all of our patrons over there very, very much. Uh, Michaela, we also appreciate people who have taken the time to uh, subscribe to the podcast and to leave us reviews because that is what we need. Uh, you know, you make make people love us and then we'll we'll be uh, set free in the in the podcast world. Michaela, where can they do that? That's right. You can find us on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, um, Good Pods, anywhere where your rectangle uh, can get um, podcasts. Uh, what you're listening to us on right now, I'm sure there's a subscribe button. Uh, you just have to find it. Uh, we really love what we're doing. Um, we're only able to do this because of people like your good self who uh, subscribe, listen, share with friends. So if you're loving what you're hearing, leave us a five-star review, share with us, uh, share with your friends and all your peeps on social media. Um, it is the best job in the world and we don't get to do it unless, uh, unless you're there to listen to us. It's not like uh, it's like if we created a podcast and no one hears it, does it still exist? I don't know. It's very existential. Um, so help us answer that question by not having us answer that question by having your friends listen to this as well. That'd be great. Thank you. Wow. Yes. Yes. Do all that stuff. So uh, thank you so much for joining us. We definitely appreciate it. Let us know what you think about Gladiator and let us know if you're looking forward to Gladiator too. Mix up a cocktail and we'll talk to you next time on Drink, Drink the, the Movies. movies. Shadows and dust. Shadows and dust. Oh, apparently Jaman Hanchu Juba is going to be back in Gladiator Part 2. So maybe it's not going to be all bad. Hmm. Pedro Pascal is going to be in it. It's going to be okay. Paul Mezcal, Denzel Washington, the whole crew, everyone.